Hello and welcome my partners in crime and as always I say that in the nicest possible way. So today is another true crime, it's a solved crime. Now it's a bit of a controversial case this one. It's a little bit like the Alawalia case. If you haven't seen the Alawalia case you should watch it. I suppose it's about, um, this is a domestic abuse case, all right, but it's a, it's, it's like the Alawalia one because, um, how can I say it, with the Alawalia case, Alawalia killed her husband because of long-term domestic abuse. She was charged with murder and then she got off on man manslaughter due to what they call a slow burn, so it was a defence of slow burn. Well, this is the case very similar but now in 2015 when we've had the new laws come out for coercive you know control and this behavior that they exhibit over us and the power that people um, in domestic um, abuse relationships sort of have over us this is a similar case to this so this case is the Sally um, Callan case now again as with the other body one very controversial. You have some legal people in the legal profession that think it is a license to kill, that she was given a license to kill, and others think that it was down to this coercive behaviour and this, you know, <clears throat> that led her up to this. So I'm not going to comment at all on this case, I'm just going to tell you the facts of this case, tell you the law, how it's changing, what's going on, and leave this one up to you. So if we're ready, okay, this is it, so <laughs> um, the way she killed him, this is a bit graphic, alright, this case, it is a very graphic case, um, but it's a very interesting one, and it really, it, it, this is one for the new up and coming lawyers, the law students and stuff, when we're talking about defences, but also where the challenges may come in to these defences depending on who your client is. Okay, let's go. So, on this rainy sort of Saturday morning in August in 2010, Sally Callan left her house in Claygate, Surrey. Her home, own house, okay? She had brought this house less than a year earlier. This was the first step away, really, from this 31-year sort of marriage. She'd been married for 31 years. Don't forget that, 31 years of marriage. Now I've been married 40 years or coming up, 40 years. So, you know, I can understand people getting divorced and stuff like that. But she had left this marriage, got her own home, took a settlement, we'll come into that a little bit later on, moved out of the marital home, brought another home just around the corner after leaving a 31 years of marriage and she left him. That's another important fact. So this morning she returned to the house just around the corner of her former marital home. As I said, the husband still kept this very large property and she had left the year before, brought this home, set up home on her own. Now this morning she had gone round to the marital home where her ex-husband still resided. So she thought that, actually, I think the best thing is to do is to explain her about Sally. Is in this relationship, even though they'd split up, was getting divorced or divorced, um, I did, they had got divorced because there was the settlement. She had moved into this property with her, one of her sons, she had two sons, one had left home totally, she had took the oldest son with her as well, to the property. But what not many people knew was, was Sally, and her ex-husband were getting back together. They were forming now this new relationship again, but I told very, very few people. That's what's been stated. So Sally, who was uh, 56 at the time of this reconciliation, and she was going back to her, hus her husband Richard, who was 61 at the time of his death. So they were about to you know, begin to clear out this family house and put it on the market. Now, their home, or this home that uh, Richard was in, was worth around 1.1.2 million pounds. Um, and this was an in, 
this was going to be sold, as was her new home going to be sold, which was worth a few hundred thousand. And then they was going to sell everything up and their plans were to reconcile. Let's, you know, move on with our lives. We've made a mistake. We're getting back together. We're going to sell up everything. We're going to go on a lovely, long, extended trip to Australia um, and then just have this massive adventure. Um, just you and me. Then we're going to come back and we're going to buy a home and live happily ever after. That's what Sally is saying that the plan was within this relationship at this time, on this day of this murder. So Sally leaves her home. She goes then round the corner to Richard's home. And when she gets there, he's like, right, before we do anything else, I want some bacon and eggs. Can you make me bacon and eggs? But I haven't got any, so you have to go to the shop and buy some bacon and eggs for breakfast, you know, and do me a big breakfast. Um, you know, so <laughs> off she trots to the shop. Now on her way to the shop, she realises, hang on a minute, he wants me out of the house for some reason. That's what she's thinking. And this is what Sally's saying in her confessions and stuff. And um, so she, as she's walking up this shop, she's thinking, right, okay, I know he's up to something. But you see what Richard didn't know was the night before, and probably on previous nights before that, Sally had been checking his phone. She had always checked his phone, gone through his emails and stuff like that. Now Richard was quite a womaniser. Um, he didn't really, you know, hold, hide it, I don't think, very much. And she had always put up with this. But don't forget, these are now going to reconcile. So they've had the 31 year, year, years marriage. They've now separated, separate lives. Now they're getting back together. Now she's still checking his phone. She's now walking down this shop thinking, right, he had a phone call um, and a text message from a woman. He wants me out of the house so he can continue to talk to this woman. That's what she's thinking. That's what she's telling you she's thinking. Um, so I think she just then really was so suspicious of him really. Um, and she just knew, because I suppose she'd had years of it, um, that you can, you can sort of tell. Or so she thought. So this quick check of this phone confirmed that she had a, he had a call and this number belonged to this woman called Susan. Now Richard had met Susan through a website actually called Dinner Dates, okay? Um, and then sort of when she got back from getting her, you know, the morning breakfast with all this going on in her mind, as she's walking down the shops buying this bacon and eggs to go back and cook for this man that she now believes is having an affair or trying to start an affair with Susan. She comes back home and she sort of says to him, can you explain this phone call? And he tells her, no, I haven't got to explain anything to you. He also tells her, don't question me. Because I don't think the whole of her marriage, she has been able to question him. I don't know what Sally thought would have changed in that year, but that's what he said to her. So Sally then, leaves it like she normally would. Won't question him, won't do anything. She's seen these texts. She is intent now on the belief that Richard and Susan are having some form of affair or he's trying to have an affair with this woman called Susan. So Sally cooks the breakfast. She then serves Richard the breakfast. <laughs> breakfast put it on the table, all set out, all lovely, all how he likes it, okay? All how he likes it. And as Richard's sitting there eating, Sally leaves. She goes and picks up a hammer. She comes back into the kitchen while he's sitting at the kitchen table eating his breakfast. Sally beats him with the hammer 20 times around the head and kills him. Now, to make sure he's dead, she then gets a tea towel and she shoves it so far down his, bro his throat just in case, you know, for some miraculous reason, this man survives a hammer attack of 20 severe, severe beating from this woman with a very large hammer. And then just to top it off, let's chuck a tea towel down his throat so the man is definitely dead. 
then what she does <laughs> she, you know by this stage this is why I don't even want to get into this case I'm just going to leave this up to you so anyway after doing that right <laughs> um, she then leaves a note so after doing all that she then wraps him in some old curtains and then writes a note and says I love you Sally and leaves it on his body just places it there on his body and then cleans up the kitchen washes the dishes does everything she's meant to do dead body laying on the floor wrapped in old curtains <laughs> literally blood would have been everywhere because this was a severe attack on this man severe head injuries at least 20 blows to the head plus the tea towel shoved down his throat so it wouldn't have been pretty at all but she cleans up she does her normal thing cleans up then decides to leave so she drives back to the house her own house that she shares with her son David or their son David the next morning after giving David then at 23 year old a lift to work Sally drives to Beachy Head she parks her car and then she calls her cousin and confesses and then walks to the cliff edge it took the um, suicide prevention team hours to talk her back from the edge but I think what I want you to take into this is that this woman has done all this the morning before killed him wrapped him up left the note on there cleaned up drove home never said a word not to her son not to anybody you know to make sure he's dead I think then the next morning she's still not said anything to her son she's took him to work then she's drove to Beachy Head she's had time to think and plan and you can say she's had time to think and plan a defence can't you or is she um, in this state of where this is really what's happened there's no reason or rhyme to what she's done um, it's just an act of um, murder there's this you know with this case it's, it's very strange but you need to know all the little details so, so you can make up your own mind whether you think this was coercive behavior or whether it was just murder and this is really the question with this case because um, you know there's a, it's difficult isn't it when you think because as we go through her past and his past uh, there's not that much in it to tell you the truth anyway uh, 10 months later anyway once they've talked her down she's uh, you know been arrested and everything else and 10 months later Sally then stands in the dock of Guildford Crown Court looking nothing like this well wealthy and she was wealthy well kept well managed woman um, her hair's a mess she's lost her front tooth her fingers are nicotine stained and she can barely speak right so listen killing someone when you have the grief and, and it, a lot of people have remorse and grief you know comes with that can make you like Sally but also can be in court for murder all right you know sometimes that can also give you these same symptoms so in this setting you know of out of this murder charge the prosecution then painted this picture of her as this possessive and possessed wife right she was angry pissed off that she had um going to reconcile with this man um and that then she's found these texts from this susan uh wife's i think her name was and actually susan gave evidence and explained that the call um, had made which had made Sally snap because this is what they think happened was that Susan and Richard had arranged to go out on a boat the next day but Richard had called to cancel because of bad weather and she had called him back to rearrange something else like a lunch it wasn't actually anything she actually said it was a platonic relationship and there was no sexual anything in this relationship at all that was it and she actually said that she found Richard a really nice man 
but she hadn't been married to him for 30 odd years so we, we give Sally that one but at that point with what Sally read into them texts and that was not the truth it's what she assumed to be the truth because of what she says is the behaviour and this coercive behaviour throughout the whole of her marriage that's what she's saying why she snapped so Sally this is what the court was told about Sally that she was obsessive that she checked Richard's emails hacked into his messages and actually even counted his Viagra now Richard was a 61 year old man okay and at this time he wasn't with her even though she states and very little people knew about this reconciliation um, you know uh, he used Viagra and he would have been free to be seeing anyone he wanted at that point um, and we now know don't we by Susan's statement you know and testimony to the call that Richard was not having an affair of her at all it was just Sally's messed up mind now whether she was messed up because of all this behavior going on throughout her marriage or whether she was just obsessed by him and if she couldn't have him then no one else was it could have been that anyway when she was asked you know uh when they asked her like why she had killed him her explanation was that she didn't know she had no clue why she had done it um she said um she wanted him to be with me that's what she said i wanted him to be with me so listen as a prosecutor right in this case um i think they had really a good case there wasn't much there was no history in this case of domestic abuse at all um not that would warrant this you know there was um a history of um depression and stuff uh, and listen, even his family, you know, Richard's family seemed to be on her side. So there was probably a lot about Richard that we didn't know. Now, the, the problem is, is that Sally then was charged, wasn't she? And, and in the end convicted of murder, because really that's what she'd done. So at the end of this seven day trial, she was found guilty of murder because of the facts of the case at the point of this when this happened and, and this call, that's what was put forward to the jury. Now, with the Aloe Olia case, again, we have now a defense team that didn't do right by her, but we also have now a defense team for Sally that really didn't do right by her because when the family and even Richard's family were telling you know, her defense team about his behavior, what he was like, um, I think he was only ever aggressive once when they was very early married. Um, yeah, first few weeks of marriage, I think. And he sort of pulled her hair and, and down the stairs. But after that, you see, Sally never argued back again. She'd done as she was told. Her boys have stated that it was Richard's way or no way. Now, listen, being married 31 years, you know, um, it's a lot different than being married now. When she would have got married, you know, um, I, I think it was, for, I hate to say it, but it was a very old fashioned marriage. Now I've been married a long time and you know, we've both said, me and Sally would have said the same oath as I've said before in marriage, where you know, love, honor and obey was still in when we got married. And a lot of people take them vows so seriously and Richard believed in that and so, um, he enforced that role of that love, honour and obey. Now, Sally was said that she um, didn't really have control of any money. He'd always worked and had the money. Um, she would be told, you know, when to go to bed and when to sleep with him and when not, you know, this sort of thing. And that had gone on for many, many years because that was part of this early marriage that she had come um, accustomed to, I suppose. So whether she saw it as coercive control, because in our day there wasn't coercive control around, okay, actually until 1994, you know, I think it was 1994, um, the law changed where a man then could be um, charged with raping a wife. Before that, because you had this love, honour and obey, that couldn't be done. And we spoke about this in the Alawalia case and the different defences in there. 
but you see this to her defence team didn't think of any of that even though even his family her and his sons were saying what his behaviour was like because there was no domestic abuse no doctor's letters no you know most people when we say domestic abuse and different things like this you would have evidence but a lot of people don't have evidence because a lot of people for one don't get hit because coercive control is not about physical harm it's about psychological control it's controlling you in a psychological way which is detrimental to your health and may end up doing something like this and it was the same with Alawalia's case now when I talked about Alawalia's case in the same sort of context she was married for 10 years and she was beaten as well as psychological so you had the, a lot of different abuses going on there and that control behaviour as well there and um, really she didn't speak very good English and stuff and her you know, I, uh, defense team let her down and she was then charged and convicted of murder and got, you know, a sentence. And then on appeal, when they brought out, you know, the domestic abuse sort of side of things, she was then um, released out after, done for manslaughter and released out on time served. And this is what's happened to Sally's case. Because now when we're talking about coercive behavior, we are looking, aren't we, at people's mental states, what psychological damage someone, the control of someone over you can do over the years. And I think there are hints of it here with in Sally's case, because when you think that when they'd done the divorce, I mean, the divorce lawyer had said that when the settlements were sort of trying to go through, you know, you're negotiating and stuff like this, it kept changing until really Sally's part became less and less and less. Now, Richard ended up with like a million, 1.2 million pound house. Sally got very little part of that settlement, even though she'd been married to this man for 31 years and it, they married with nothing and built this all up between them. So something it was even looking wrong there, wasn't it, really? So... Do I think where there was con con coercive control? Yes, I do. But to what extent, I don't know. And just because she's left him, she chose to leave him. But when you've been married to someone, and this was the same with Alawalia, Alawalia's husband was leaving her, and then she killed him. Sally's husband and her were really split up. They were going to reconcile, so Sally says. But they'd always split up. She couldn't cope with that split, even though she had chose it. It's very difficult for women in this sort of situation where you have been in this relationship, this controlling relationship, where they've done everything for you, even if they're hurting you, physically or psychologically. That control is still there, that need for them, because that has been your life for so long. So it's difficult. In, this is a difficult case this, for people that don't understand it and especially the law because even sometimes when I read things like this I think you know uh, this lawyer was good that who got this through but anyway when she you know and to say she didn't know why she killed him she probably didn't right so she's either very good and as some lawyers have said that she, this really she's planned it well, she's given herself a defence of this coercive behaviour which didn't come out till 2005, this case was 2010 and then um, so once that came out that gave her grounds for an appeal but it also gave her grounds for appeal because of the way that her defence team didn't use any domestic abuse at all, any control whether it was coercive control or whatever before because what they said is that they didn't want to blacken Richard's name they didn't want to be seen by a jury or the public to darken the name of a victim of crime. But not all people that are victims of crimes are victims, are they, really? Sometimes there's a reason why, but whether you're going to blacken someone's or try to blacken someone's you know, character or whatever, the truth must come out, and they didn't do it. And that then left Sally open then 
to an appeal. That's why she got the grounds for appeal. One, because of the new laws of coercive behaviour, and two, because her defence didn't put up a defence for her in any way at all, like instant loss of control, or whatever. They'd done nothing, diminished responsibility, they tried nothing. They listened to a woman that clearly was um, not right at that point. She tried to commit suicide the next day. But as the prosecution said, when you're looking at both these cases, Alla Wallace and them, the prosecution's really got a straightforward case. And the defence just seemed to go with it. And that's wrong. If you're going to be a defence lawyer, then you need to defend your client and find out what's really going on. Because after 31 years of marriage, why did Sally just all of a sudden, one morning, after making this man breakfast, smash his head in with a hammer 20 times and then shove the tea towel down his throat? So far down, this man, that would have killed him, let alone any head injuries. There's a reason why people do it. She had 31 years to do it in. She didn't. Now, when I usually teach my classes, and we call it a slow burn, so in Alan Wallier's case, it was a slow burn, wasn't it? And I say to my students, it's like lighting a fuse. You know, you know these old bombs you get in the um, um, cartoons? And, you know, they light them and it just slow flex, isn't it? And it lights, you know, slowly burns until all of a sudden, bang. That's what a slow burn is. That's what defense of slow burn. And women, especially women who are victims of domestic abuse or coercive behavior, react like that. It can take a long time. And it can take a long time, actually, between the, to the last time that the person hit you to when you actually react. That's also part of it. So with Sally's, this coercive control, this behaviour that he exhibited towards her over these years, where he was a womaniser, he'd have affairs, and he was very open about it, and he was, you know, people sort of avoided going to Sally and Richard's house because of Richard, because of his way he was with women. He was sort of uh, all over you, and, and spoke quite down about women even to your face, quite sexualised in his way of talking. But was that enough to kill him for? She'd put up with it for 31 years, she's left him, I don't know. But that sort of was his character. He wasn't well liked at all, really. And, um, but did it mean he had to die? I'm gonna leave that one up to you. So anyway, on sentencing, when she was first sentenced to murder, and she got life imprisonment, Judge Critchlow, now, he told her that she'd been eaten up with jealousy at Richard's friendship with other women. And she probably was, right? She probably was. You can tell that by the way that she was, you know, looking at his um, emails and counting his, you know, medications and stuff and, and stuff, just, just in case he, he needed that for somebody else. So you, you can imagine where the judge and that had got this from and also the jury. And um, I think... It's like, he said to her, you are someone that's killed the only man that you have ever loved. Uh, and you have to live with knowing that. And I think this is what I said, when you see Sally 10 months later, is this a woman who's been Ill, eaten up with guilt over killing a man that she actually loved that much, she killed him? Really, it's a very difficult one, isn't it, this one, to get right. Anyway. This case, again, has made headline news, and this is the reason why, because really this is, again, another landmark case. Because the minute you start bringing in new laws like coercive behaviour as a defence for someone that has murdered someone, not just hit him once, but multiple, you know, <laughs> wounds to this man, then wrapped the body, but left a note, cleaned the house, you know, gone home, took you know, no, not said a word to anyone, took the um, son to work the next day, rang the cousin, confessed to them, then went to Beachy Heads to kill herself, but didn't. You know, it's a, it's a really, of course it's going to make headline news, it's going to make headline news even more, and be such a landmark case, when the next one, when the appeal, she wins. And she wins it on the grounds of coercive behaviour. 
And that's what is so controversial about this case because again it's split down the middle. Lots of people believe that Sally has got away with murder and really made coercive control a license to kill for some, depends on how good your lawyers are. Others believe that domestic abuse and the slow burn or coercive, coercive control is a real factor here and that women can only take so much and it's maybe not that action, that last action of Richard texting someone or sending her down the shop to get the bacon and eggs. Something that could have triggered her could have been a year back, six months back, to do this. And that's where this case lies. So anyway, Sally was released and she was then, um, she was dropped to manslaughter and she was allowed out um, on time served. And then because then it was manslaughter, she was then allowed to um, go for his property because she was the next of kin. Yeah, in his will, the property and all his estate was left to her. And because she didn't have the murder charge, then she was allowed to have all that. So this is where I'm saying to you this case um, <laughs> gets a bit strange because you think, okay, she's now benefit from, benefited from a crime. But my issue is here, yes, I understand and I agree with both. These cases are so hard when you think either to defend, defend or prosecute now when you're coming up with new laws because coercive control is such a new law out and to prove it and it didn't take a lot to prove in this case because there wasn't a lot. There was no medical history of any physical abuse at all. There was no history really apart from the family members that said how Richard was. You know, I, I think Sally's very lucky to have got this uh, defence to work for her. Uh, I think she had a very good legal team. And I think what they used was, and as I've said before, the marriage, the length of the marriage. Now, if you was married five years now, maybe you wouldn't get away with it in that way. I think where the relationship was formed so many years ago, and what I call the old-fashioned way, my kids call the old-fashioned way, you know, my way, really, of when our marriages were different, when we was, you know, I think it's difficult for me because I've been married a very long time, and my husband isn't like that at all. Um, so, I, you know, it's difficult to understand, but I can understand that some men and women who was married then, where the women didn't work and they stayed at home and, and, and it was all about the man, the man's rights, there was no domestic abuse rights or anything for women in them days when Sally married him. But she left. They was already divorced. You know, she took it that far. She'd ended that relationship. So, I don't know. Is this murder? Did Sally get away with murder? Is coercive control the new license to kill? I'll leave them up to you. The other thing that we've really got to think about here is if we're using coercive and control as a defense, domestic abuse victims are not only women, they are men. So we've done a lot of cases, haven't we, of where men have been and stabbed and killed their victims, their partners, sorry, to death. I think we have to be really careful here because if we're saying that coercive control is just a woman's defence, it's impossible. So it could also be a man's defence. Now, if there's no history, like Sally, there was no history of it, of any abuse apart from a little bit of depression and a bit of what the family said. Are we opening the doors up here to abusers now pretending to be victims at some stage down the line? You see when we open up these cases and these new laws 
and we allow different defences in. The defence has to be applied to everyone. It's not just a woman thing, is it? Men are killed, quite a few a day actually, by in domestic abuse. And men are also prone to coercive control because they're in a relationship the same as a woman is. And so this is my issue with this one. If she had more backup, I suppose, I don't know. You know, more evidence, I don't, I, I don't know. But she won and she's out and good luck to her, all right? But I will leave this case up to you because this is, for me, I've got my opinions and you may, uh, <laughs> you may know it or not, but um, listen, it is what it is, isn't it? So, <laughs> this is Sally Callum case. Coercive control, murder, man's daughter, however you want to put it, who served, I think, about nine years before her release and her case then was dropped down to, or charges were dropped down to manslaughter and she was then able to claim all of Richard's estate. So, uh, it's, I, just, I suppose you all know, or you can guess where I stand on it, I just don't know. I, you know, this is a case for me, when I heard it and I was, um, I heard it when it first came out and I'm, um, I think even with the Anna Wallier case, both these cases are cases that you can go either way on, right? But the facts of the case here, there is nothing. There is no broken bones, there's no hospital records, there's no nothing that stated that Stanley was a victim of domestic abuse. It's her word and the word of some people that she knows and he knew that he was controlling, using controlling behaviour throughout her marriage. Is it enough to kill for? I'm not sure it is. But it's not for us to decide, is it? Because these she's out, you see. I'd love to know your opinions on this case. Really, what do you think? What do you think of this new defence? Because that's what it is. It's a new defence. And if it's been used once, it's going to be used again. Now let's see who by. So, you know what to do. Thumbs up if you've liked it. You can subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. You can follow us on Instagram, you can follow us on Facebook, and you can watch this on pod or listen to this on podcast when it comes up. So thank you for listening. And until next time, bye-bye.